videos we don't reveal any addresses and even though I've done a house tour of my own place, please do not show up at any private residences because it's not safe for anyone. Internet culinary sensation Salt Bay's real name is Nusret Goche. And long before he'd have millions of followers or charge his customers as much as $1,100 per piece of steak wrapped in 24 karat gold, Bay started his life in a family so poor he had to drop out of school at the age of 12 to help support everyone. His rags to riches come up began in a poverty stricken area of East Istanbul, Turkey, where he grew up as one of five children whose father was always away for months at a time, working inside of a nearby mine. During a conversation with the Times back in 2019, Salt Bay would reveal that as a kid, he'd often travel to school wearing shoes and shirts that never fit him properly because his parents could afford nothing else. Another side effect of this poverty was that his family pulled him out of school before he came an adolescent so that he could help earn money working as a butcher's apprentice. Starting from a young age, Salt Bay would wake up at 6 a.m. and travel two hours on a train, as well as 30 minutes by bus just to get to work. Then once he arrived, he'd stand on his feet all day, occasionally washing dishes and assisting others as a kitchen runner. It might sound like hard work and make no mistake it was, but all of this experience in the culinary industry would inspire Bay to own and operate his very own restaurant. As an adult, Salt Bay convinced the bank to lend him 2,500 pounds so that he could travel to Argentina to learn more about his craft. Years later, he'd return to Istanbul, and at the age of 27, he opened his first restaurant. But before we get into what his eateries are like, first, let's take a closer look at the glamorous spot Salt Bay calls home. At the age of 39 years old, Salt Bay lives in the polar opposite of the type of environment he grew up in as a kid. Instead of living in a ghetto today, he calls a nearly $50 million palace home. After establishing himself as a force in the industry in 2017, two years later, Salt Bay would move out of his former residence in the Basiktas district and purchased himself the infamous Mashka Palace situated in the area of Shishli. This luxurious spot sits in the middle of Istanbul's most famous fashion and business oriented neighborhood. And if you're thinking this building looks a little big, even for someone as rich as Salt Bay, well, you're not wrong. While Salt Bay might own this building, you can actually stay here as well, seeing as how Mashka Palace is a fully functioning five-star hotel. Salt Bay is rumored to have splashed as much as 36 million pounds on this luxury park Hyatt hotel, and then moved into his very own apartment located on sites. In fact, the very flat that Bay moved into was once owned by a 20th century playwright who was known all across Turkey as the Grand Poet. The world famous author of Macbur died in this apartment way back when in 1937. And who would have thought some 80 years later that one of Turkey's newest celebrities would move in? At the time of his decision to splurge in the hotel, the social media sensation told the press that he decided to do so because he wanted to spend more time in the Turkish capital, so to be closer to his mom. And while Salt Bay most definitely keeps quiet about the exact details of his inner sanctum, we know that when it comes to the rest of the property, the building boasts a total of 90 generously sized rooms, as well as suites with prices that start around £350 per night. In fact, according to their website, this fancy spot not only offers its own luxury rooftop pool and a stunning sun lounge area, it also invites its guests to experience unexpected pleasures, such as dining in one of the world's finest food and beverage facilities. And yeah, if you're capable of putting two and two together, then it should be pretty obvious who owns the restaurant on site. It's Sol Bay. Shortly after moving in, Sol Bay made a huge deal about this milestone over on social media where he made sure to inform his many fans that he'd finally fulfilled a lifelong dream. Turns out, Salt's plan all along was to buy a hotel where he could live day in and day out while also working at a five-star restaurant located on site. It's a unique dream to say the least, but he's managed to accomplish it nonetheless. Outside of his homeland, Salt Bay is also reputed to own properties throughout the US, where he's sometimes pictured relaxing by a private pool believed to be located somewhere in Beverly Hills. He's also been spotted in more rural areas of Texas state riding horses on what looks like to be a ranch. But when it comes to real estate, the vast majority of Salt Bay's actual holdings all come down to his restaurants. 
At the age of 27, Salt Bay opened up his very first Nusrat branded steakhouse in 2010 with just 8 tables and 10 employees. It wouldn't take long for him to meet Turkish tycoon Farid Sank, who was so impressed by Salt's culinary abilities that he offered to invest in the chain and helped Bay launch locations in Ankara and Dubai. But Salt Bay wouldn't really become, well, Salt Bay until 2017. That's when his career exploded after a viral video of his now infamous Salt Sprinkle took off online. That 36 second Instagram clip birthed a new internet sensation, with even Bruno Mars reposting the video. Before he knew what was happening, Salt Bay wearing his now classic working uniform of a white t-shirt and black jeans was the hottest butcher on all of social media. Generating that type of internet fame meant that Salt Bay could expand his culinary empire into the United States with restaurants popping up in Dallas, Boston, Beverly Hills, and New York City. But it wasn't just America that suddenly wanted themselves a bigger helping of Salt Bay. Countries like Greece and Israel also optioned France franchises of their own in Mykonos and Tel Aviv. And sure, some of these locations aren't steakhouses but burger shops, a concept that's been described as a slightly more formal shake shack with table service as opposed to ordering from a counter, which are much more casual than Salt Bay's other locations. If you dine at one of Salt Bay's burger joints as opposed to his steakhouses, you're bound to miss out on the type of experience that many have come to expect from his spots. I'm talking the outlandish flourishes of sword butchery along with a barehanded seasoning that made Salt Bay such a star to begin with. The steakhouses are also where you'll generally spot Salt's celebrity clientele. I'm talking the likes of Cristiano Ronaldo, David Beckham, DJ Khaled, and Leonardo DiCaprio. In fact, considering the average price of a meal at a Salt Bay steakhouse, celebrities might very well be the only people who can actually afford it. Out of the 22 steakhouses that Salt Bay owns around the world, you're average customer is going to drop at least $200 for a meal, but in many cases, it'll be a lot more than that. Not only can two orders of fries cost as much as $30, while one plate of pasta will set you back $70, but then there's his world famous gold wrapped tomahawk steak that costs a mouth watering $1,160. With profit margins like those, is it any wonder when Salt Bay opened his location in London a couple of years ago that the place pulled in $8.1 million during the first three months of operations alone? Well, with those kind of figures floating around, it's not too shocking that Salt Bay calls a palace home in his native city of Istanbul. Hopefully one day he'll invite his fans inside for a closer peek at his actual living area, but until he does, that'll bring this house tour to a close. Thanks so much for watching today's episode, and before you leave, consider answering the following question. What would be the biggest drawback to living in a hotel suite 24 seven? On the surface, it sounds like the epitome of luxury, but there's gotta be some drawbacks to it. Let me know in the comments below. Otherwise, like, subscribe, and turn on your notifications. I'm Kara the Vampire Slayer. Follow me on Instagram to chat. And if you enjoyed this, then be sure to stay tuned because coming up, I'll be taking you inside the headquarters of another popular internet sensation, Barstool Sports. I'll see you all next time. Bye. Over the past few years, Barstool Sports has more or less become an American institution where millions of sports fans and comedy lovers go to find their daily fix of something company founder Dave Portnoy likes to call sports smut. Dave originally created his company back in 2003 in Milton, Massachusetts as a print publication distributed to the Boston metropolitan area, offering gambling ads and fantasy sports suggestions as its bread and butter. But it didn't take long for the brand to expand and launch its own website in 2007. In these videos, we don't reveal any addresses, and even though I've done a house tour of my own place, please do not show up at any private residences because it's not safe for anyone. Over the course of the next nine years, Dave would build the foundation of his business brick by brick until January 7th, 2016, when he announced an emergency press conference in Times Square to reveal that the investment advisory firm known as the Chernin Group had purchased a majority State Barstool. Following the acquisition, Dave continued to run the site while also retaining complete creative control over his baby, but there were a few changes afoot. 
Most importantly, for our purposes here today, during that same press conference, Dave would reveal that Barstool was moving its headquarters from Milton to New York City as part of the deal. Where were they headed? Oh, uh, just a little up and coming neighborhood known as Nomad, an area of Manhattan once known for its numerous wholesale stores along Broadway. But now it's become a hotbed for luxury condo buildings. During 2016, Barstool Sports moved into 15 West 27th Street, leasing a unit that was just under 6,000 square feet large. One year later, they'd nearly double their office space by leasing the entire second floor of the building, bringing their grand total square footage to 11,800. At the time of the announcement, the building's owner, the Kaufman Organization, released a statement that read, We are excited that Barstool Sports is continuing to grow as they are the ideal tenant for our loft style spaces and bring a youthful and fun vibe to the building. To be honest, that last part is probably something of an understatement because based upon the information that we were able to uncover about their headquarters, I'm not sure that the people who work at Barstool are ever doing anything other than having the time of their lives. Best look we've ever had of behind the scenes inside Barstool Sports headquarters comes courtesy of a drone tour they uploaded online a couple of years ago. At the time, Dave's right-hand man Frankie Borelli had discovered a video detailing the inner workings of a local bowling alley with a drone effortlessly floating in and around the patrons of the venue like some sort of ballet dancer gliding across the stage. Once Frankie figured out that Jay Christensen, who runs Jaybird Films, shot that footage, he instinctively knew that he needed to get this dude into Barstool to do the same for their headquarters. And that's exactly what happened, with Jay capturing the entirety of this massive space in just one take. For starters, the Barstool headquarters is located right across the street from what was a gourmet deli and pizza spot that's more or less perfect synergy considering how Dave David made a name for himself off of his one bite pizza rankings. Once you're inside of the organization's second story office space, you'll discover their very recognizable branding draped across the walls, not to mention a whole bunch of debris littering nearly the entirety of the office floor. One of the first major studio sets you'll come across is where the hit podcast series Lowering the Bar is shot, a space that provides just enough room for its hosts to sit at the bar and enjoy weird food and drink combinations that very might well leave them gagging. A short hop from there is an entertainment room and gathering space known as the Gambling Cave, where employees can commune to watch whatever game is currently on TV and commiserate when they inevitably lose a boatload of cash. And because lighting cash on fire can be such hunger inducing work, located right next door to that is a kitchen galley with a little bit of everything, including an indoor grill. I really just hope someone turned off the building's smoke detectors before switching that on. Down the hall is Barstool's control center and editing suite, a room jam packed with not only top of the line computers and office furniture, but what I assume are some of the busiest working people in the building, thanks to the large amount of content Barstool churns out on a daily basis. For instance, juxtapose how busy everyone inside that room looks with how relatively not busy the folks just outside of there are in the nearby cubicle space. To be fair, even over in the KFC radio podcast studio, they're more worried about goofing around than getting down to work. I just hope they choreograph their little action scene properly because this recording space is flooded desks, chairs, and enough equipment that's bound to hurt someone if they aren't being careful. Located right next door to that recording suite is that Barstool Snapchat studio that's been painted in an all-encompassing shade of blue that personally reminds me something out of Dr. Seuss. And just in case some content at Barstool needs a more adaptive space, they've also got a green screen studio that can be repurposed in a pinch for whatever they need to film at a moment's notice. But perhaps no single spot in the headquarters is quite as impossible to move around in as the part in my take recording studio. Seriously, I don't know how anyone in here takes a step without stubbing their toe on something, or how they manage to get a drone to fly around in here without crashing. From the busiest looking space to the spark, 
Narcissist, the Yak Podcast houses its recording studio in a glass office big enough for half a dozen leather chairs and the exact same number of goofball hosts to fill them. A stone's throw away from there, or maybe a frisbee throw, whatever they like to toss around in a workspace this big, is the Chicks in the Office Podcast Studio, which sure, might not look any bigger than a walk-in closet, but it's also easily the neatest and best looking of all the studio spaces we've seen here. On the far side of the second floor is the bullpen, where writers and researchers can throw on their headphones and get all the necessary day-to-day -day work out of the way. But at least employees relegated to this far corner get to be regularly entertained by watching Barstool's countless media personalities film content in the nearby faux basement studio setup, known as The Rundown. Over here, you also aren't too far from Dave's very own office, which is set into the wall nearby. It's probably a bit smaller than you might think, but it's got everything that he needs to keep up to date with everything, including a of course, a computer and a television to keep track of his bets. And if you're ever lucky enough to get a tour of the office for yourself, you can stop by the receptionist desk or you can pick up a few Barstool Sports swag items on your way out the door. Although whether or not you can actually book such a tour is something of a question mark. I mean, I suppose you could try showing up and asking for a look around, but in all likelihood, you would simply be shown to the elevators as quickly as possible. The only surefire way to get an invite that I could find is when Dave teams with an organization like Zaki's to auction off a Barstool Sports experience that saw one lucky fan get a tour of the entire building while also accompanying Dave on a pizza review. For those of you curious, that contest was from 2021 and the winning bid ended up being $70,000. So there's a pretty good chance that most of us will never be able to afford the opportunity to see this place in person for ourselves. But at least you have this tour and Barstool's endless supply of content to get a better sense of what it must feel like to work at one of the world's most popular entertainment and sports media. Media brands. All right, everyone, that'll bring this special studio tour to a close. Thanks so much for watching today's episode. And before you head out, consider answering the following question. If there was one media company in the world you could work for, which would it be? I guess I already work for a media company. That doesn't apply to me, but I would love to read your answers down below. Otherwise, like, subscribe, and turn on your notifications to make sure you never miss a video. My name is Kara. Be sure to follow me on Instagram to chat, and I'll see you all in another one. Bye.